Welcome to Truest Blood, the official True Blood podcast. I'm Kristen Bauer. And I'm Deborah Ann Wool. And you've been invited in. I want to do bad things with you. Welcome back to Truest Blood, where we sink our fangs into the series episode by episode. This week is all about episode 111, (laughs) entitled To Love is to Bury. It is written and directed by Nancy Oliver. And fun fact, this is her first time directing for film. Did you say it's episode 111? (laughs) (laughs) Pretty close. I'm not as good. As per the title, we explore what our characters will overlook in the name of love. And we learn a little more about where baby vampires come from, Dad. (laughs) Yes. We also had the extraordinary pleasure Mm -hmm. of speaking with Michael Raymond James. He plays Rene Lanure in the series, and he has quite the reveal at the end of this episode. So without further ado, this week on True Blood... As Bill prepares to make a vampire, we catch up with Tara, who tries to talk herself out of a DUI. King, I'm an excellent driver, but you cannot prepare for a naked lady and a hog in the middle of the road. Now, you know that. However, Officer Jones doesn't buy it and takes Tara into lockup for the night. Meanwhile, Sookie is still recovering from her brush with the killer, and Sam, ever loyal, is sticking by her side. The following day, they go to Budgie to investigate a similar murder at Big Paddy's Pie House. A Drew Marshall is floated as a suspect, and they blackmail a local officer to fax a photo of Drew to Bon Tom. On the drive home, Sam and Sookie chat like two peas in a pod, and to Sam's delight, Sookie admits it's not all peaches and cream with Bill. She needed him these past two days, and where was he? I don't know. I'm so mad at him, I could spit. Elsewhere, Amy and Jason get to cleaning up the mess that once was Eddie, which leads to a hell of a fight. The next day, Jason comes semi-clean with Hoyt and Renee, which has him considering whether Amy is the woman he thought she was. Later that night, Bill's baby vamp, Jessica, rises from the grave and takes to her new life as a vampire with a little too much enthusiasm for Bill's taste. It means that I don't have to sit like a lady and I can kill anybody I want. And there's an awful lot of people I'd like to kill. Feeling utterly overwhelmed, Bill drops her off at Fantasia, hoping Eric can straighten her out. Back in Bon Tom, Letty May comes to see Tara in jail, but decides too late to practice some tough motherly love, and all the progress she and Tara had made is shattered. Instead, a vaguely familiar-looking social worker named Marianne offers to take Tara in. Having nowhere else to go, Tara accepts. Back at Sookie's, things get cozy with Sam, and as they begin to kiss, Bill flies through the door irate. But no more than Sookie, who rescinds Bill's invitation and thus their relationship. That same night, Amy and Jason reconcile, and Amy asks him to do V one last time. While they're indisposed, the killer sneaks in and strangles her. And when Jason wakes to find her lifeless body on the bed beside him, he assumes the worst and tearfully turns himself in. This is the worst confession I ever heard in my life. Fuck you, Andy. That's all I got. We end here at the police station on the facts of Drew Marshall, who is none other than Renee Lenure. <laughs> So I love the title of this episode, To Love is to Bury. I think you could interpret that in a lot of different ways. But for me, as I look at the themes of this episode, it feels like it's like, what what can we bury in the name of love? What can we overlook in the people that we love in order to be with them? Because it does feel like that's what our characters are struggling with a little bit here. Yep. And so it's something I've never struggled with, Deb. No, you know, I'm, I'm perfect in this area, just so everyone yes. knows. Like, yes, we I never of, overlook Kristen anything. Kristen and I know nothing about repression of feelings or anything no, like that. We're no, very, no. totally <laughs> very Pam, enlightened. 
Yeah, totally <laughs> enlightened. That's what it is. We're enlightened. We're enlightened. So the first relationship to 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 sort of touch upon is Tara and Letty May. Yeah. Um, they they literally use the word love in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um and it's fascinating because, you know, throughout their whole storyline together, Tara continually overlooks some pretty mm -hmm. extreme behavior. She does. And then it's this abandonment right at the end here mm -hmm. that just seems to be a step too far for her. Yeah, that's an intense scene and, and mm. sets up what's coming so well. And Lenny Ray is, from a certain perspective, correct, and it's the most mm. loving thing you could do. But right? with their history, you know, I mean, with Tara's point is... I showed up every single time. I mean, how many I times do you think Tara's had to go to the jail and bail out her mother? Yes. And the one time that this happens to Tara, her mother won't for her. Oh. Uh, I, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, her mother literally says, I love you. And Tara goes, fuck you. Yeah. Oh, my heart. Yeah. And that line, what Slutty May says something like, it's toxic for me to have you in my mm -hmm. house or something. Mm -hmm. like, wow. God, what a kick in the rear right when you're down, you know? Yeah. And then what's amazing is that we then have Marianne coming in, played by the yeah. incredible Michelle Forbes, who oh. we hope <laughs> to be able to talk to as her role, you know, increases. Yes. Um, but she does the opposite, which is that she gives Tara the benefit of the doubt. She says, you must have had your reasons. Yeah. And she oh. assumes that she does, and that, you know, and that assumes the best in her. She does. Which is, you know, all Tara wants. So, yeah, our, our next relationship then to talk about was, of course, Jason and Amy. They oh. have so much going on. And another <laughs> couple that, you know, uses the word love claims that they are in love. Yeah. And so I guess the question is, can Jason overlook kidnapping and murder? <laughs> can he bury <laughs> kidnapping and murder in order to be in love with Amy? Yeah. And I guess um, the answer is, sure. Kind of. He'll try one more. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> try one more time. She loves me. I mean, I mean, oh. she's really beautiful. Yeah. And boy, does she have a way with words. She does. She can talk. She could talk me into anything. I mean, so much of that is Lizzie and her performance. Yes. They have this huge fight. Yes. And they're so fantastic, both of them. God, if it's never going to be all right. From the minute we took him, you knew that it was going to end like this. You just couldn't face it. I didn't think it would fucking end like you this. You wanted his blood. Bad. You were with me the whole way, so do not act like this is all my fault. Now I said to clean up, so clean up! Yankee bitch! Dumb fucking hillbilly! <laughs> Even the button on that. It's so good because oh. she just holds her position and is like, yeah. oh, please, you knew we were going here. She staked him. She did. I mean, she, she killed him. But that's what I mean. You know, it's this idea of actions speak louder than words. Yeah. So clearly yeah. she killed Eddie, which is a violent act. Yes. And Jason throws up, which is a trauma reaction. So yes. we see a little bit more about where their hearts really are. Mm -hmm. But she knows how to twist it around. It's so delicious the it's way she so does delicious. it. Um, and the arc yeah, of relationships, I'm, right, where it's like, I see you and you're brilliant and you're evolved. And then it's like, you dumb fucking hillbilly. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's a, like a moment of truth for them. It is. And then they have this beautiful V-trip sequence oh. when they make up later that night. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that was filmed. But um, oh, I, I mean, I it is, it's, it's that addict thing of one last time, which is, yeah. you know, such a cliche, but sort of for a reason. Like when um, she says one yeah. more, she goes, don't get mad. And then he gets mad. Yeah. She goes, I saved one drop of V and you're thinking as an audience member, this will be it. He'll throw her out. And then he, right. He goes, okay. And yeah. you can see the look on his face played so beautifully by Ryan where yeah. she goes, okay, then I'm going alone. And there's the addict in him that goes, well, I'm yeah. not going to let you do that. It's really, really well written. Isn't it so well written? Yeah. That That's a beautiful sequence. Mm -hmm. The way he throws her into the air yeah, and running through the rain. and It's oh, gorgeous. It's, so, yeah, so that was a, that was a harness. Uh, they had, a, you know, the way that we, we do that yeah. <laughs> in TV, yeah. you have a giant crane yeah. and they would have put a harness underneath Lizzie's clothes and attached her and quite literally practical effect, 
pulled her up into the sky. Yeah. Now the stuff at the end, they would have cut her out and had her really go very far. Obviously they didn't, you know, pull her miles. Take her to the- Mars. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, that, that would have been how they would have done that. And it's interesting because even to costume choice is, t- can be determined yeah. by what, how to fit your harness underneath. Uh, I know. I was outfit. just thinking that cause I had to do some harness work. Yeah. It's not, the most comfortable thing I've ever experienced. No, nope. nope. very, very tight corset underneath your clothes. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, the main thing that in my research and, and listening to Nancy Oliver, the writer and director, talk about it was that this was a hard episode because everyone loved Lizzie Kaplan so much. They enjoyed yeah. working with her so much. And she was sort of the most difficult person for them to kill off this season. And then, of course, we have Suki and Sam and sort of tangentially Bill. (laughs) Yes, it's very aw, this episode. They're very, very cute. Oh, the way it's a daytime episode. Yes, in a daytime episode. It's a daytime, which is part of, I think, what's going on for Suki, right? Like, (laughs) yeah. If we think about Suki, you know, there's all this danger that has come into her life and all these vampire politics. And is that worth. The passion of Bill Compton. I know. Like Bill is the bad boy and Sam is the like puppy dog. He's this, yeah, he's so sweet. In fact, so sweet. he has this line that makes me giggle every time. You can't spend 24 hours a day with me for the rest of my life. Sure can. <laughs> it's oh, so simple. Sam. It's, it's so simple and it's yes. so cute. Sure She's can. just kind of like making a flippant joke and he's like, no, I could. I really <sighs> could. I, it really struck me in that moment as a, again, really good, subtle writing. Yeah. Because here she is sitting with a normal man eating yeah. breakfast like she can't with yes. Bill. Yes. And so, yeah, I can see how that would be appealing in this moment. I know. I can totally see how they ended up, you know, having a romantic moment on the yeah. couch there. I mean, Sam's like being kind of the perfect guy. <laughs> He is my, my, you know, my giggle about Sam always is talking about like burying things in the name of love. Yes. He can overlook almost anything, even the fact that she doesn't love him. The yes. fact that she's deeply in love with someone else. Um, uh-huh. But he really, I mean, he says it was the best day of his life when she walked in looking for a job. And it really must have been because he has got it so bad for her. He's got it so bad. It's so painful. And it reminds me of all the times where I was Sam, you know, Mm. where I had it so bad. It's just excruciating. Yeah. But then then you can see all those little moments where he's like getting this little tickle of delight that she's not that happy with Bill. It's like a little opening, you know. I know it only takes the slightest encouragement for us when we're in that place. Yeah. To go, there's hope. But of course, it doesn't last because this is true blood and we could never leave anyone happy for very long. No. Bill comes flying in. I think we had a joke a few seasons in about like (laughs) the like uh, uh, anti-sex Bill. (laughs) It's like there's a number of scenes over the years where like Bill interrupts coitus like right before. Oh, he does? (laughs) He does for me in the second season. (laughs) So we had this joke that like, Bill was like the the vampire condom or something, or the, <laughs> the anti aphrodisiac. Um, just no sex anywhere in the world unless it's his. <laughs> but yeah, he flies in. They have a fight scene, which is very exciting. And Sam actually gets a few shots in, I know. which is against a vampire. So clearly, he like he's flips got his own him stuff. over. I know it's that was very impressive. impressive. It really, really was. And my favorite part is while they're fighting, Suki goes, stop fighting, you stupid men. I love it. <laughs> she smashes him over the head, Bill, and the, yeah. the line of, does no damage whatsoever. I know. They don't even notice. Uh, but, oh, it's such a funny moment. It's such a funny moment. And then up comes my favorite mm-hmm. line. Can't you see what he's really like? And I can even think about being with him. Sam, my living room's wrecked. I've got a killer, a vampire, and a shapeshifter on my plate. Right about now, I'm not thinking about being with anybody. <laughs> That's one of those lines where you need <gasps> such a great actor. Oh, you do. To root that in grounded moment. Yep, <laughs> yep. And and writers who know they have an actor who can do that. Like, exactly. they know they have Anna Paquin. And yes. so... 
because because you write it going, oh, I hope I hope you can sell this, but they can do it because they know they have her and they know that she'll give it absolutely everything. It, that oh, God, very very true and so well said. <sighs> and now for a quick bite, movie magic. One of the most intoxicating scenes of this episode is Amy and Jason's V-trip. So just how do we go from Jason's dark bedroom to a sun-soaked rainy lawn? Jason's bedroom was recreated on a truck bed and hauled out to Huntington Library in Los Angeles. Dark panels of fabric called flags are held by crew members to block out the daylight. Then, rain towers up to 20 feet tall are placed out of shot and hooked up to hydrants or large-capacity water trucks. A variance in pressure can create effects from the lightest mist to a torrential downpour. Rain towers can be very loud, so a non-talking scene like this one is ideal. As action is called, the flags are pulled away, the rain towers are turned on, the camera pulls back, and the actors are free to frolic. So, how to make a vampire? <laughs> yes, yes, Kristen. Where do baby vampires come from? Uh, well, can Dad, you tell me? Yes. Um, they <laughs> when a vampire from, uh-huh. and a vampire love each other very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when a vampire and a seventeen-year-old girl love each other very much, or just met, or it don't want to go into a coffin for a hundred years and go insane. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's mysterious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the basic thing is you have to drain the person and then fill them up with vampire blood and then bury (laughs) them for a day. That's all? Wow. Don't have to water them, nothing. They just come up vampire. (laughs) You don't got to do nothing. You know, it's kind of funny because I was, you know, now that we're doing the podcast and I'm watching this over and over, I'm like, wait a minute, Mm -hmm. wait a minute. So Bill got out of the grave, Mm -hmm. went and cleaned up. Right. Took a shower, you know, came back, went and got some true blood, came back. Did not go to see Sookie. Did not go to see Sookie. Right. Ooh, she better not find out about that. I know. A whole day. A whole day. And then he's just waiting. But it's very funny. There's a line later where, you know, Bill's trying to explain to Jessica uh, how, you know, the process of it. And he's like, it's very mysterious. Even we don't know how it works. And I was like... (laughs) Good plot armor, writers. <laughs> you just throw in, yeah. Just throw in, we don't really know how it works, and then you can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I drained well you, then I fed you. Anyway, it, it's, it's... We don't really know, so <laughs> if it changes later, don't at me, you know. <laughs> yeah, because we didn't really see with Lorena. He didn't, we didn't see him get buried, and she fed him... When he was... I think Bill says when he was out. He, yeah, when they uh... were on the bed. And he so, was yeah, it's a, it's a, there's apparently a lot of ways to make a vampire. It's he was dying <laughs> and she fed him, but then you yes. appeared pretty dead. I was really dead in that moment. You yeah. Were dead. You, I, I guess that was the idea is I was like full on just dead there and he was going to feed me in the grave together and you kick me in. I kick you in. Which is funny. They wouldn't let me do that. They A stunt double did that because mm-hmm. I, I wasn't a series regular yet, so they couldn't really beat me up without SAG coming after them. <laughs> yeah. But my stunt on the day was yeah. it was really hard to kick that stunt person into the <laughs> hole because my heels were sinking yes. in. I the could not put was on any sock. weight on my heels. That's so right. I was standing there trying to balance oh. and it's slightly uphill. And it was so hard to be immortal and strong. Well, I got to tell you, Kristen, I so you intimidated me a little bit when I first met you because you're did. so beautiful <laughs> and you were oh. so in character and like and, and I was also I was young and easily intimidated. But that night, because you were so <laughs> sort of silly and sweet about the fact that you couldn't stand up, <laughs> it like shattered all of that fear for me. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> like. Someone I can talk to. Yeah. Aww. Because yeah, I literally I really kept that. falling backwards. Because <laughs> you couldn't be cool and immortal. I couldn't. And I, I needed someone who was going to be, <laughs> you know, with me in the in the trenches, quite literally. Yeah, that was the beginning. Then you taught yeah, me Sudoku and we were off to the races <laughs> in our friendship. That's right. But you and Bill have, uh, again, a very iconic exchange during this scene. 
I find myself doubting whether you were ever truly human. Thank you. Damn you! Oh, and listen to that that music swell. <laughs> I know, it's good. Oh, but I love that. It's so Pam. Uh, she's so pleased by that. <laughs> I know, she's so complimented by that. <laughs> That's so observation, yeah. So tell us how yeah. you were buried alive. Buried alive, yeah. What did so you do is in a, there? This is... <laughs> Well, like, yeah, I had a lot of time to just read and <laughs> reflect and <laughs> a little, little flashlight. Yeah. Um, no. So, yeah. So here here was the process on my night. It may have evolved over the years. But um, when I was buried alive on like my second day on True Blood, <laughs> they dug a hole that was deep enough for me to crouch in and still have, you know, a good portion of my head covered. They shored up the sides so that it wouldn't cave in on me. So there were like wood sides to it. Yeah. I crouched in that hole. They gave me a walkie talkie because they said once the dirt went over, I would have trouble hearing anybody right. else outside. Right. And they buried me. Yeah. Now, when they got up to my neck, they had me cup my hands around my mouth and they gave me a tube with which to breathe through. Weird. <laughs> Very weird. Yeah, that's weird. And they told me that right before action, they would pull the tube, but that because I had held my hands there and created a little pocket of air for myself, <laughs> that that would be enough to breathe and that I would hear action on the walkie talkie, at which point I could begin rising from the dead. Um, but we did that a couple of times. They would just cover me over with dirt. Right. So again, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, we need to bury someone alive. I guess we'll just bury someone alive, alive. We'll be, as we'll get safely alive, as we think we can. Who's an actor, so they're game. And they're game. We'll, we'll just bury them. They're desperate for work. They're, so. they're always desperate. So then I had to do my big emerging and my scream. And oh, I, I found yeah. my script. It says she screams like a baby with a grown-up voice, and it has an irritating quality. <laughs> so oh my gosh. I have to say every other stage direction in this script for Jessica is annoying. She's annoying. She's irritating. So I really <laughs> leaned in, man. I was like, great. I know what my job is. It's to make Stephen Moyer absolutely <laughs> like cringe. hate me. Now, did you practice it at home? The scream? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. um, but I had lots of ideas about it because I, I knew we were going for like vampires in nature. As I mentioned, I looked at animal videos last time. Yeah. And so I wanted something that felt like, again, like primal, like old, like yes. from another time. Yes. Um, and I had been playing a Nancy Drew computer game. <laughs> Okay, you just ruined like like I mentioned Sudoku that we just lost so many viewers. They're like Sudoku if, and if Nancy viewers, Drew. If viewers have not yet figured out that I am an enormous dork, then you have not been paying attention. Yeah, and I'm um, right behind her. Right behind her. I was playing a Nancy Drew computer game mm -hmm, in which mm -hmm. you had to identify whale song, like whales based on their song, oh, on yeah, their yeah. sound. And I was so kind of enamored of it mm. and so I wasn't trying necessarily to do a whale sound that doesn't right. make a lot of sense but something in that that very old very yeah. hollow and I also went it has that wham of a baby quality but yeah. with that lower larynx which felt like a grown-up voice so I was like that sort of fits like what they're going for yes every time I did it we live in LA the coyotes would join me ah uh. So as I'm screaming, there's this, oh, off in the distance. And then like three more would join them. That's so cool. Oh, so cool. But keep in mind, this is 3 a.m. and people live near here. Right. So after about the third time I did it, we started getting calls to set of shut that girl up because you're waking up the whole neighborhood and the coyotes aren't helping. And are you thinking so, like that's an irritating quality? Like I nailed it. I nailed it I'm, because I'm, no like one the, can stand me. The coyotes are responding. I'm the best actor no ever. No one can stand me. This is great. <laughs> it's perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was not at all mortified. Yeah. Um, but so for the rest of the night, I just, they had me just silent scream. I would just open my mouth oh my gosh. as wide as I could and make no noise, which is the most bizarre oh, so awkward. thing to do. And then, of course, we kept the sound or I did it in ADR or something later and we added it uh, in post. 
you know, but we did get a couple of them with my my full on scream. I did <laughs> love the look on Bill's face. He gives you oh, yeah. a look a few times in this episode that is just like, oh, this oh is... it's just <laughs> it's so difficult for him. Um, and I think that's interesting, actually, you know, because Bill, he's a you know, he's a, a, a reluctant maker. He didn't mm-hmm. want to be a maker. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like his maker. He doesn't like what happened to him. And it's fascinating in the conversation between Pam and Bill. They're both making a lot of assumptions about Jessica. Right. You know, like any parents do, you know, right. Bill is assuming that her experience is going to be like his turning, which was awful. Yeah. Pam is assuming her experience is going to be amazing because yeah. that's how Pam felt about being turned. Yeah. When, of course, Jessica's experience is much more complex than that. So, yeah, I really love this this turn that happens for Jessica oh, here. It's the this best, Deb. You just nailed it. You absolutely <laughs> you. killed it. Because, And I love the why, why. <laughs> why? And then the last why is different. Why? Yes. You know, that was all of it is just amazing. And this was Thank your, you. this was an audition scene too, the one where you. Yes, this was the second okay. audition scene that it's I did. So tough scene to do, so many turns, <sighs> but the turns really sell it. Thank you. Yeah, I think so too. I think it was well written in that way. Mm-hmm. So this is the first turn for Jessica. You cannot go home. That part of your life is over. No more mama and daddy. No more little sister. I'm sorry. No. No more belts. No more clarinets. No more homeschool. No more rules. I'm a vampire! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I love that so much. I love it. You throw your arms over your head. Oh my god. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, it was really fun, I think. And I, you know, again, a lot of credit to Nancy for writing a very unexpected making. It wasn't so grim. It was really much more, uh, you know, there was a lightness to it in some ways. Yes, yes. So I I found my whole script to go through and sort of see what happened. And there is no yeehaw (laughs) written. It is written, it is just written woo. (laughs) So crazy Deb in the moment decided that yee-haw I'm a vampire it's great the yee-haw would is be, so good <laughs> would be fitting for a southern girl um it must so, have yeah. just happened in the moment if you don't, I don't remember, remember right I do not remember consciously doing that so at some point <laughs> crazy Deb was just like yee <laughs> And it happened. Um, and was it a fun night filming? Like it was. It was so wonderful. I really had a good time, and and I remember bonding with Steve because again, mm-hmm. I'm a nervous person, especially around other people, and yeah. I think I was timid around Stephen. And right. you know, if we haven't talked about it yet enough, Stephen is the most personable, yeah. comfortable, funny oh. person to spend the night with. Just if the you best. ever, just the absolute best, Literally. and I. Every time I had a scene with him, I looked forward to it. Yeah, me too. Um, and that night, we really, we bonded. He asked me about my life and my relationships and how I got the job and why I was here. We talked about Bill and, you know, I we didn't know what this relationship was going to be yet. Um, right. For all we knew, this was it. Right. But he still, you know, even though I, he literally could have never seen me again. And he treated me that night like I was part of the family. Uh, The other recollection I had specifically about that section, because I remember someone bringing up to me later, and as I watch it now, that I I pluralized clarinet. It's it's written singular in the uh, in the script, but I say it pluralized. And I was going through all of my old notes, and this suddenly all flooded back to me. I had created this this huge backstory for myself because my process is about like creating attachments to all the different things so anything that i say i mean that list right yeah mama daddy sister belts clarinets homeschool rules like i have to have a relationship to each of those things okay belts obviously says a lot about who jessica is and where she's come from yeah yeah so with clarinet the story that i made (laughs) 
was that my parents sent me to the worst clarinet teacher on the on the planet, the kind that would, you know, wrap your knuckles if you played a wrong oh, note kind oh, of thing. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that as an act of teenage defiance, I threw my clarinet in the lake. Uh, and that it meant that my parents then had to buy me a new one and that I got beat for that. Uh, and that, and I thought maybe they'd let me stop, but they kept sending me back to her. So as an, I, I kept throwing them in the lake. More even belts, though more clarinets, even though I knew I'd get beat, it was like I had I'd created this story for myself in my mind oh, that Jessica, so this good. was her one act of like, I'm taking control. Yes, right. Yes. If you're going to beat me, it's going to be because I decided it, not because you did. Had a whim. So in yeah. my mind, it was like dozens and dozens of clarinets. Oh my gosh. So again, it's one of those moments I really wanted to highlight because sometimes things that sound weird or sound like a mistake or seem like might actually be cooler than that. They might be more than that. And so, you know, always yes. offering uh, that perspective on what happens from these things, because it does sound a little a little odd when I listen to it back. But I'm like, oh, no, I know why that happened. Oh, my gosh, <laughs> that's so cool. And, you know, when I hear that speech, when I saw it again, it's so good. And I did think it was specific mm. because each line, you know, cause it's a mislead and then yeah. it's no more belts, no more clarinets, no more homeschool. Like they were specific beats. Yeah. And that's why, because you had, it was specific to you. Yeah. I had, I had a stories for each of those. You I'm going to try that things. next job I get. I'm going to do <laughs> my backstory. That's it. You know, and again, we're talking about turns. So another really fun turn for Jessica <laughs> so in good. this one so is, uh, this is one of my favorite lines. I, I want to kill people. I'm so hungry and all you do is talk and I'm starving and you're so mean. And you're supposed to take care of me. That's what you said. And no, you suck. <laughs> That's funny, because you do suck. <laughs> I love that. I oh love God. that so much. It's I, it was, so genuine, that moment where you take the time yeah. to find that funny. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Again, it's in that writing. It's because it's those turns on a dime that mm -hmm. kids can do, right? Mm -hmm. Kids can be absolutely the worst moment of their lives. And then all of a sudden, as excited as <laughs> having the best, best time ever. Yeah. And then um, back again. It, it really yeah, right it is a again. thing with kids, right? Their That's life right. is over. Really is then thing. they're laughing. You're facile that way, You're right? You're facile. So yeah, what I was going for really was like a toddler because a mm -hmm. baby felt too yeah, but like a toddler, mm -hmm. a sheltered teenager, mm -hmm. um, but like on cocaine. But high on cocaine. Yeah. Because I have all these new powers, right? And right. they were so specific in the script about like the things like touching the bark of the tree, eating dirt, like I said, eating my tears, yeah. that things smelled better. You saw more, you heard yeah. more. And how intoxicating that would be. Plus, yeah. like, the adrenaline of dying, right? Right. Um, and no impulse control because you're a kid. Yes. So, like, all of that together just creates this, like, manic teenager from hell. And Bill's face at the end of that scene says it all. I was going to say, I have Bill's face in my head <laughs> as you were saying that. It's perfect. Both of you were sublime. <laughs> And I know that was just an a bonding, wonderful yeah. night. Yeah. That started the beginning of quite an arc, quite a run. Yeah. And now we got to interview Michael Raymond James. Oh, he's so wonderful. This episode mm -hmm. ends with a big reveal. And Michael stopped by to discuss his thoughts on portraying the secret big bad of season one. Well, great. I mean, we'll start just by saying thank you so much for coming and, and talking with us. I know it's yeah. been quite a while since <laughs> we all did the first season of this show, but obviously we could not do the first season of the podcast without talking to Renee slash Drew himself. It's been about a hundred years, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. I'm stoked to see you guys, man. Yeah, know, it's so yeah. good to yeah. see you. So tell us first how you got the part. For True Blood, I, I remember getting the appointment and 
you know, it said Cajun accent. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm from Detroit and there's not a, a lot of Cajun people in Detroit. I mean, it's a, it's a, <laughs> right. it's a French city, you know, once upon a time, Le Vie de Trois, but there's, there's zero Cajuns uh, in Detroit. Right. So I, I had no idea what a Cajun person sounded like. So I found some examples and, and I found one particular example, which I thought sounded cool and it was, it was fun. So I, I kind of went with that and, you know, made all the notes on there and, and uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the page itself and, and was completely prepared to say those lines, those exact lines in the sure. Cajun accent uh, that I had prepared. Yes. I don't know if it was, it certainly wasn't, it wasn't a Cajun accent, but it was the one I had. So I did it. So I did the thing, and and Alan was like, "That's that's really great. Uh, do, would you mind if if I gave you a, a, another scene from a future episode? Could you could you maybe oh. read that?" And I was like, oh, I, "Of course, you have to say yeah." And I was like, "Yeah, of course, yeah, totally." And, and he was like, "Just you, you know, <laughs> oh just God. take your time, and you know, go outside and give it a look over, and we'll bring somebody else in, and then and then oh, we'll have you come back in." I was like, "Fuck, I haven't." I don't know how to say these words with the Cajun accent that I'm bringing. So uh, I, I sort of went out into the hallway and I'm like, I'm running around. I'm talking to, uh, you know, one of the casting associates there. And I was like, do you have a pen? I, I need a pen. I have to write on this thing. I have to figure this out. Yeah. And so they're like, yeah, sure. Okay, here you go. And here's a desk and you can sit over there and we'll just, you know, whenever you're ready, just kind of knock on the door, which, which is also a really, really uncomfortable wow. thing yeah, to do. Sure. Just... Well, just also out of respect for the other actors in the waiting room and stuff yeah. like that, you just, mm. there's no, there's no way to not feel like there's a glaring neon sign on your chest that says asshole. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. So I go out and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of dealing with that anxiety and, and they call somebody else in and I'm scribbling and I'm like, I'm sweating and I'm trying to make these new words <laughs> sort of sound. Oh my God. <laughs> in any I bet you the sweat uh, admit, helped. Yeah, to, to, well it was Los Angeles <laughs> it was probably 172 <laughs> degrees but um <clears throat> I was I was I I was freaking oh out God. trying to get like oh, well how do I how do how does this how's this word going to sound like the a sounds like this over there and that word and like well that okay that, so I I I guessed I made my uh -huh. best effort at guessing what these new words would sort of sound like and after two or three people went in kind of ready now and when that last person came out um i just kind of peeked my head around and i was like hey if if they're ready i'm, I'm i'll give this one a shot you know we'll run it up the flagpole see <sighs> if anybody salutes it anyway so i go back in there and i and i read this this other seed and and i look over and alan's just kind of doing his nodding thing you know that he does. <laughs> he's just where he's in thought and he's thinking and he's, there's these yeah. thought bubbles coming up but to me i don't know yeah. him yet and i they look completely Looks like the Sims. It's just like <laughs> emojis right. yeah. and exclamation yeah. points. Yeah. And he just kind of very calmly was like, that's great. That's great. Thank you very much. You know, and I'm like, ah, fucking yeah. screwed it up. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Yes. All right. Course. Thanks. I'll see myself <laughs> out. And um, I get home and I get a phone call and they made an offer, you know, and it was oh wow, gosh, same the day. same day. Yeah. <gasps> but yeah, it was, it and was your, the same day. your accent was incredible so then yeah. how did that oh, evolve thanks. once you got it well so once mm -hmm. literally on that phone call from my my agents and my managers i uh, you know i, I said I, I need to find a dialect coach now we need to we need to pay we need to have hbo pay was my first thought it was um, for real yeah yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. um which <laughs> they declined but um <laughs> <laughs> really that's one thing actually we'll have yeah. to talk about that none of us had none dialect us. coaches official dialect coaches or anyone on set all and, of it was sort yes. of home home brewed, brewed. yeah exactly it was, <laughs> it was all handmade yeah. it, it was, was all handmade but um i did some research they looked around for me uh, but i found this guy named Errol Gidry uh, and i the reason i found him is i was looking up other people who had played cajuns and there wasn't a lot but the mm -hmm. but Michael Jeter played a Cajun in the Green Mile, and I found this guy Errol Gidry had coached him in that. So I somehow got in contact with Errol, and I had him come over for a meeting to my place, and, and you know we we hit it off, and he was great. And so right. you know after every script came out uh, and every new draft came out, he was my first phone call, and Alan was really really fantastic with allowing me and Errol to kind of take a bit of dialogue 
and and switch it yeah. around a little bit, you know, because Cajuns change up their mm-hmm. sentence yeah. structure, you know, and so, mm-hmm. you know, they'll say things like, how you doing you, you know? Um, yeah, I know that that pronoun <clears throat> at the end is fascinating yeah. with the me, you, Very us. May, yeah. It's so distinctive. May, yeah, may, yeah, chef, a true. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and Alan, who is, you know, I mean, he's just this genius writer, creator, showrunner, uh, you know, who had, you know, done six feet under before this. Um, and I, this was like my first sort of big TV job, you know, and uh, he was, he was so gracious and so cool about me switching things up because I was so, yeah. I was so determined to, to, to make it authentic, you know, as authentic as I could. Mm-hmm. I, in fact, I pitched Ellen on this idea that Sort of like in Snatch, I was like, there should be subtitles when I talk, you know, because I, I, I <laughs> right. want it to be so deep. Right. You know, yeah, I want to go far, far, man. Yeah. I want to go far. <laughs> well, and remind me if I'm wrong, Kristen, I think you've seen, you may have seen this episode more recently than I have, but they actually do find in Drew Marshall, quote unquote, car, t- uh, dialect on tape. Yeah, they uh, find a practice. box in So even, even Renee... You know, it's not his know. natural accent. I, so you have, you have a little wiggle room in there. I can't tell you how right. mad that made me. Oh, did it, I, so mad. I bet it did. I bet it did. You're like, I hired this guy. I, well, I was like. Paid uh, him out of my own pocket and it's a tape. Well, I, I, I sort of I sort of looked at it like, in, in my, am I not pretty? I, like, is it? Did, <laughs> did I, I, did I fuck it up? And uh, you guys are kind of trying to hedge your bets a little bit. And. <laughs> I don't think that's it because I think the accent's fantastic. Oh, I think it's it's to add to the duplicity of Drew slash Renee is what I think it is. Mm-hmm. They needed we'll a go hit with that. We'll go for with Suki that. to find. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, you're. I mean, all of that that hard work that goes into it. Um, and you know, we're just talking right now about the language. Obviously, there is a tremendous amount of just actor prep work that goes in as well. Um, was there anything specifically about Renee or do I mean, I'll tell you one thing I love when quote unquote, the bad guy or the killer has a romantic storyline. I think that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and true blood did that so well. I really love Renee and Arlene and it's so <laughs> sad. I know in the end. So yeah. So for you in preparing, what were some things that really jumped out for you? I, I mean, there was so much work just with the sound, you know, that occupied yeah. a lot of my stuff. And, you know, I, I did know that I was going to be the, the killer, right? Like, you know, Alan had okay. pulled me aside and sort of let me in on it, which was which was really helpful because... A lot of times they don't. A lot of times they don't. And and anybody like Renee um, will be fractured inside like a cracked mirror, you know what I mean? And yeah. So he'll have good parts and he'll have bad parts. We're also talking about a guy who lives around a bunch of vampires, so it's not, you know. But um, a little more bit more wiggle room. Yeah, but so <laughs> I, uh, I just, you know, I wanted to kind of lean into um, this idea that, it, you know, some of that comes from things that are beyond his control. And what he can control is, you know, I'm sure he was a very sort of, uh, conservative person in terms of, I don't mean politically, but I, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he was into Southern genteelness, you, you know, that is kind of antiquated, you know yeah. what I mean? And the way he would right. would treat Arlene and the way he would treat her kids, he would try to see himself as yeah. a gentleman. And think, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, get down on one knee when you propose and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah. he saw himself as chivalrous, you know, Yet I still wanted to lay in whenever I could some breadcrumbs into his mm-hmm. his you know psychosis psychotic nature, um, and, and it was fun sort of trying to find those things. Ellen would talk to me about that a little bit. Like what I want here hmm. is uh, just an element of that, so that when you know people don't see it the first time they watch it, but when they go back and watch it the second time or third time, they maybe mm-hmm. pick some things up. And so that was. That was for me the most fun uh, was trying to find those moments where I could kind of add an element of psychotic yeah. behavior um, without it reading as mm-hmm. psychotic behavior the first time you see it. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Well, let's talk about co-stars. You worked a lot with Carrie. You worked a lot with Ryan. Um, you know, can you share some of those experiences? And we all, yeah, we've all had a lot of fun seeing what they bring to the parts. And uh, yeah, you got to work really oh closely Oh my God, I, I love Carrie. I love Ryan. I, I mean, it was, <laughs> working with Nelson was always such a, oh, yeah. I mean, just such a joy. Yeah. You know, rest in peace. He was, he was just, he yeah. was a genius. You know, he was somebody who was- yes. like, absolutely touched so that was always a treat i mean carrie carrie and i worked so well together i mean we would crack up all the time yeah i just i remember <laughs> laughing more than anything i remember just laughing all the time yeah um, i just laughed all the time yeah yeah and i re i would see you kristen you know all dolled up with your leathers and all that shit <laughs> I, like on a, like on on a, a different, different stage as I was coming out, I was, yes. I was, it was kind of like, like those old cartoons where like the, you know, the day shift workers are clocking out and the night yeah. shift workers are clocking yeah. in yes. and everybody's got yeah. their lunch pail and Hey, how you doing? Whatever. Uh, it was, that's so true. <laughs> but, yeah, um, uh. but yeah, you know, and, and Ryan, uh, I worked a lot with him and Jim and it was, it was just, it was it was a lot of of fun, except for when I had to do the the killing stuff. That for me that wasn't that wasn't as much fun. That when I had to kill Lois, um, you know, Granny, I, mm -hmm. I and this was completely unplanned. But when when it and it wasn't written this way, but when it happened, I started crying. I just I started weeping because mm -hmm. she's so yeah. sweet. And and gentle and and brilliant and you know she's this yeah. um, she's this legend in our business um, yeah. and I was so yeah. grateful just to work with her and then just to have to yeah. stab her repeatedly while she's screaming no no it was like blood curdling to me but I had to keep uh. doing it uh, and I just had tears coming down my eyes and Alan's like that's great. Do that, like, let's bring the camera around and get Michael while he's crying. And, like, now, of course, like, not, now the tears kind of dry up. But um, yeah. it was, I remember. Because there was that line where you were, you were crying and you say, you weren't supposed to be here. You weren't here. supposed to be here. Yeah, and it, th yeah. that line was there, but it, it, was, it, was, it was written sort of, uh, you know, there was no emotion attached to it, you know. And, wow. and it just kind of Thank came you. out, which was uh, surprising um, <laughs> and mm -hmm. horrifying. We're talking about in this episode as a theme, the meaning of love. Yeah. And that's so different for a serial killer, right? There's, but, it, but it still feels like a motivating factor for Drew. Yeah, it's bizarre, right? It, I mean, I, I see, I hear this with trophy hunters, right? Where they say they never feel as close to the wild animal and they never feel such love as when the life is draining out of it while they hold it. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, serial killers of animals, but it's because he probably, if he didn't love his sister, he wouldn't have killed her for being with a vampire. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a bizarre... It's a, it's a warped way, you know, it's just trying to put yeah. two and six together and come up with peanut butter. You know what I mean? It's... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but to him, that yeah. makes all the sense. Of, well, yeah, peanut butter, man. You know, that's, yeah. that's 100%, yeah. you know, uh, a valid conclusion. Um yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, to a, a a a less fractured mind, it's it makes no sense at all. But to him, it makes all the sense in the world. And you try not to judge that, you know, right? Yeah. Right. When it goes right along with the point about chivalry that That's you made, right. that mm -hmm. he he sees himself as a yep. gentleman, and all of these things fall right in line with his perspective of That's who right. he is, uh, even if the rest of us are going, <laughs> what? Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. In the jail scene, yeah, where Suki is telling Ryan, I'm I've almost got who the killer is. And you're behind her. We know, the audience knows because we've seen the facts that it's you. But I swear your body language changed oh. into serial killer. Now is it's, that it's on, really uh huh? Well, I was just looking at, so my dogs, when they get tense, it's that like tension at the back of your neck kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't see the back of your head, but watching you work in that moment, whether you knew you were doing it or not, I see that same little like mm -hmm. tension. The hackles. There's no tell. Yeah. There's just that little hackles and it's so uh, brilliant. Wow. Yeah, it was super creepy. That's, um, that's, <laughs> 
That's thank you. That's uh, no, that's really nice to hear. I genuinely don't recall the scene, but I but I, I can say that that you know, as we talked about earlier, I was always on the lookout for things I could I could I could breadcrumbs I could sort of lay yes. down. Well, to that end, then, yeah, you know, in that very last episode, the climax sequences, now you get to let full serial killer Drew come out and play, you know, and you're chasing Sookie through a graveyard with a, you know, the, <laughs> all this stuff going down. Was that more fun because it wasn't killing Lois Smith or was it another aspect of yourself it, to play yeah, with? Yeah, it was or, fun. You know? It was fun because it, it felt like the accumulation of, of all the stuff from before, right? I was, this was the time I right. got to kind of put it all together in one package. And one thing I remember from that episode was that, you know, there's a part where I'm, I'm in a truck and I'm singing mm-hmm. along to the flying burrito brothers. Yep. And, and that was for whatever reason, that was like, it's, there's such freedom in that singing along mm. to music. You can just get weird, uh, and mm, and yeah. then you can like you can bring yeah. that you can bring that sort of freedom that we, you're never more free than when you're singing along to music while you're in your car. You know what I mean? Like there's oh my gosh, it's so <laughs> funny and so true. It's that perfect little vacuum. Hundred percent. You're just yes. no giving yourself know. a concert, you, can... you know, and it's <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's never sounded more amazing. You know, like. <laughs> So now, do you feel like in genre, speaking of going nuts, how is it different than playing a quote unquote normal person? Like the freedom of it, the the layers we get to go after. Do you feel like there's a difference? Yeah, there's a I think that there's a difference in from an audience's perspective, but that doesn't change. There's no difference in my approach to it. You know, the approach remains the same. From obviously from an audience perspective, it's a little bit different. And you know, the words, the things that you're saying may be bizarre in real life, right? You know, fangbangers and vampires, or the words are different, all that shit, but it's the approach is the same and the words kind of float on top of, you know, the work, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. It does seem like sometimes, you know, we've been talking about the extra grounding, though, that it requires, that because you are talking about things that are a little, you know, out of the ordinary, that it, it requires potentially a sense of belief that is a little bit stronger, a little bit more <laughs> yeah, steadfast. I, 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 I under, yeah, I hear what you're saying. And, uh, I, you know, but but for me, the the belief was no more different for Rene talking about vampires than he would be talking about another ethnic group or something. You know what I mean? It was yeah. it mm-hmm. was as real right. as peanut butter again you know what i mean like it was just yeah. it was peanut natural <laughs> um you know and, and i i was by by virtue of the sort of role i was able to kind of lean in to focusing so much on the sound uh you know the accent mm. that um you know making that sound real kind of was a a blinder for me everything else was was able to sound real because of you, you know the, the words mm-hmm. i was saying sounded real because I was trying to make the accents sound real, if that makes sense. Does that, yeah. you know? It does make sense. What does sense. sometimes when, you know, for at least a lot of people talk about, and for me, acting is so much about specificity Absolutely. and yeah. focus. And if you have something really specific to That's focus right. on, it can help let a lot of that other stuff just float along yeah, with absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, usually you approach a scene with, you know, okay, what am I doing? Right. What, what is it that I need right. here and where am I coming from and and what am I going to? Mm-hmm. And so those, those are the kind of the balls that you're juggling and the words are the words, the words right on top of that. doesn't yeah. matter what you're saying, you know, um, yeah. you know, then you add in all the other elements, the the wardrobe and the, and the, the makeup and the hair and the, and, and it, it, it you can just kind of drop in to this other world mm-hmm. and it's beautiful. And I love this fucking work we get to do, you know, yeah. it is so cool. So did you become kind of, it's hard to say, you know, I think this is very hard to have perspective on, but did you become kind of a fan of the show or did you have a moment where you were watching the show and you thought, ah, I love this show? Yeah, I I was a fan of the show, but it's hard for me to separate if it was, yeah, because I was just, I was watching my friends work and I was rooting for everybody Mm -hmm. and it was... Yeah. It, it, so I, it was it was that was fun for me just to see, you know, my friends 
you know, doing things and, and making choices and stuff, it seems where I wasn't yeah. there for. And I'm like, oh, it's a great choice. Yeah. And the question I have sometimes, I'm like, shit, I don't know if I could have, if I could have done that. I don't know if I could have made that choice. Oh, I don't know if I could. And, and it was inspiring to yeah. me. Like, so I, I, oh. I absolutely became a fan of the show in that sense where I was, it was just kind of watching my friends and cheering everybody on and, yeah. and being inspired, you know? Well, can I ask then about leaving early in a way, you know, like you came and had this amazing arc for mm -hmm. season one and then had to kind of say goodbye. And, you know, how did that feel? I know it was early on, so maybe it doesn't have quite the same hold on you. I don't know. It sounds like it did. Though. Yeah, it sucked. You know, I left it and it was fine and it wasn't, you know, it was just a job. I didn't know it was going to be as huge as it was. I, I, I certainly was bummed kind of saying goodbye and leaving everybody, you know, Simon and Wayne and, you know, like out, yeah. the whole crew and um, the cast. The and yeah, it was, I was, and I adored working with Alan and he was so sweet and, and gracious to me on, on multiple occasions outside of the work that we do um, for True Blood. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then the show became this, this big hit and I was, I was stoked about it for, for everybody. And, uh, you know, then, I was asked to come back for an episode here or there. Uh, and I remember coming back and the cast had grown like oh tremendously. Yes. And it was like the call <laughs> sheet was completely different. And now yeah. you guys, you know, every, you guys were doing like 20 day episodes instead of the 10 day episodes yes. or whatever. And it was, you had yep. multiple units going all the time. It was just a big machine. And I felt like the kid huge. who, you know, used to go to this high school, but then his dad, <laughs> you know, my, my family had to move, yeah. you know, and, and so I went to another high school across the country for a little bit. And then I was coming back to my old high school and right. everything was different. You know what I mean? Like, wow. I kind of it felt like that for me, like, um, but it was, it was, it was great seeing everybody again. You know, it, it was great to be on. Uh, I, I missed it when I left, but I, I continued to watch it and that's not something that I that I do wow. usually that's not routine, you know. But I I would I, w I just felt such a connection to everybody on that show, you know, that I wanted to continue watching and find out what everybody was doing, and you know. That's remarkable. Well, I'll let you know because you know I sort of came in as you right, were leaving, right. and so we didn't cross paths too much. But I remember a day. I'm not gonna remember when it was, which season, but when you must have been coming back. And your name was on the call sheet and all that stuff. So I knew there and everyone was talking about, oh, God, Mikey's back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be like, oh, I can't have to I have to find it. Like it was like it was it was less the kid who had been away from high school and more like BMOC back on campus. Everybody get oh, ready. Shit. Up your oh, game. It had more of that feeling to it uh, from our side, at least my side. And this was. You know, you talk about it being True Blood being your first big thing. I mean, this was <laughs> I had never done. I'd done a lot of weird theater and then yeah. True Blood. <laughs> so I was definitely feeling very green and very new. And uh, it was it was like, ooh, cool oh, kids back. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how nice that is to hear, Deb, like even all these years <laughs> later. And I'm, you know, this old man now. Uh, that's that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Yeah. But I remember it's a big deal. Oh, it's definitely a big deal. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this was such a pleasure to speak with you. So and, good to see uh, you. You remembered far more and had incredible stories than you let on. So <laughs> uh, hopefully they're true. Your memory was not a problem. <laughs> no, they don't need to be true. <laughs> they don't need to be true. No. They don't need to be true. No, we don't yeah. care. Who's um, going to check? Yeah. <laughs> no, man, this was a blast. Thank you guys for, you know, asking me to do this. It's been a real privilege watching your work through this first season because you know distantly Kristen and I or at least I will I don't watch my own work I have reasons why Same and lots here. of things but it means I didn't really see much of the show so watching it now seeing your work I think again even knowing that Renee is going to be the killer in the end watching it through I like him no. so much <laughs> and I'm every time I'm like no maybe this time when I watch it it'll be different I know <laughs> I was thinking about that why do I root for it to be different I root for him. Well, it it because, it's because of Michael oh, Raymond James. Yeah, it's it because is. of the performance. It's because how honestly it's done, how mm -hmm. grounded it is. And so just really a pleasure to hear a little bit about how you came about doing Oh, you guys it are awesome. very true. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much.
I love talking with Mike. I mean, oh. he he's such an actor's actor, I think. I know. And at the same time, like the realest, grittiest, funniest, most charismatic. I but oh. I just, you know, thinking about those days and like just loves acting, loves being there, yes. loves the people, loves the opportunity. Oh. He's so funny every time. I yeah. mean, it is amazing that I have a sense of who he is because we never had a scene together. Yeah. So it's really parties and conventions and and now to get to see him again. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love that we're doing this podcast. Next week on Truest Blood, we wrap up season one. Can you believe it, Kristen? No, I cannot believe it, Deb. <laughs> we made it. We made it, and it's been so amazing. It's amazing. Uh, we finish with episode 112, You'll Be the Death of Me. The season finale is all about second chances and new beginnings. And we can't think of anyone more perfect to round out the first season of this podcast than Alan Ball. He oh. he envisioned this, he created this, he wrote mm -hmm. this, he directed this, he held everything together, and we are so lucky and delighted and grateful that we get to speak with him. So thanks for listening, Trubies. Subscribe and follow wherever you listen to your podcasts, and we'll see you next week. Y'all come back now, you hear. Truest Blood is produced by Safe Haven for HBO Max. Executive producers are Janina Kavankar, Kristen Bauer, and Deborah Ann Wool. Our producer is Gabrielle Gallon, and our audio producer is Christopher Wool. Our theme song was recorded just for this podcast by Jace Everett. Additional music was composed by Timo Chen. And remember, you can watch all of the original episodes of True Blood on HBO Max. Hey.